Welcome to episode 262 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Sherry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to Jerome Lorraine, retired agent and former team leader of the Jackson Division's Pascagoula Resident Agency's Safe Streets Task Force and former task force officer Joseph Nicholson. They review one of their kidnapping and murder investigations. In 2001, David Cannon abducted and bludgeoned to death Thomas Early Beasley III. Shortly before the murder, Cannon and Beasley had met at the Missabama Saloon. Cannon became enraged after Beasley allegedly made a sexual pass at him. Beasley's body was later found floating in a pond in rural Alabama. The Say Street Task Force worked the case and made a consensually recorded conversation between a confidential source and Cannon, wherein Cannon admitted to the murder. The Jackson Division's evidence response team ERT, and the FBI lab conducted forensic examinations that were significant to the successful prosecution and resolution of this case. Jerome Lorraine served in the FBI for 30 years. He was primarily assigned to the Jackson Division's Pascagoula, Mississippi Resident Agency, where, in addition to leading the Safe Street Task Force, he also led a high-intensity drug trafficking area, HIDA, unit investigating drug trafficking organizations, street games, and violent crime. He was also the team leader for the FBI's hostage negotiators in Mississippi. He is currently working on his memoir, featuring many more of the cases he worked with the Safe Street Task Force. Former Task Force officer Joseph Nicholson has worked in law enforcement for the past 28 years. Currently, he is the director of narcotics, for the Jackson County Sheriff's Office in Pascagoula, Mississippi. He served as a task force officer on the FBI's Safe Street Task Force for 14 years. Now, before we get to the interview, I want to let my reader team members know that I sent out my June email on Monday, June 6. In it, I write about the amazing time I had in New York teaching and presenting at Thriller Fest, the world's biggest conference for thriller and crime writers. I also review a new FBI TV spinoff show that has me wondering how the writers got basic FBI policies so wrong and why it matters. If my June email is not in your inbox, you know what to do. Check your spam filter and promotions tab. I want to welcome new listeners. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there are links to where you can join my reader team to keep up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies, buy me a coffee, and visit my website to learn more about me and my nonfiction and crime fiction books. I want to thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guests, Jerome Lorraine and Joseph Nicholson. Hey, Jerome. Hey, Joe. How are you? Hi, Jerry. It's good to be here. I'm excited to learn a little bit more about the work that both of you did when you were working together on the Safe Street Task Force. Where were you located? In Pascagoula, Mississippi, which is down on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. We're about 45 miles west of Mobile, Alabama. Mobile would have been the FBI field office. Our field office is actually Jackson Division, which covers the entire state of Mississippi. But because we're right on the state line, we had a lot of interaction with our mobile office. Okay, well, that's interesting. When we were communicating about you doing this case review, there were a number of fascinating cases that you could talk about. But we decided to do this one. Could you give us just a little short highlight, either one of you, Jerome or Joe, of what we're going to be talking about today? Sure. It's a hate crime, kidnapping, murder investigation. And we chose this one just because not a lot of people have heard about this case before, and it was kind of before its time. It was before we had federal statute that made it a federal crime to commit a murder based on somebody's sexual orientation or gender. 
this happened back in 2001. So it was kind of a case that was really before its time. All right. Where do you guys want to start? When the incident first kicked off, it was April 26, 2001. And the Sheriff's Department, the Jackson County Sheriff's Department, got a report of a missing person. And Thomas Earl Beasley III was a 37-year-old construction worker. He was a veteran of the Gulf War, the first Gulf War. He was a staff sergeant in the U.S. Army. And he went out to the Miss Alabama Saloon to have a few drinks. And he never returned home. Nobody ever saw him again. And that started a missing persons report with the Jackson County Sheriff's Department. They took the report. Six days later, in Monroe County, Alabama, a Alabama game and fish warden was walking in the woods, and he discovered a body in a pond in Alabama. This body, where it was found, was 130 miles from Pascagoula, Moss Point, Mississippi, where Beasley came up missing. At the time, the Alabama authorities, the sheriff's department there in Monroe County, they didn't know who the person was. They had a suspected foul play, suspected murder victim, but they didn't know who he was. So they did a unidentified body flyer. They put a picture of the corpse and they sent it to area law enforcement agencies. When they did that, they got the Jackson County Sheriff's Department, a detective saw the flyer and put two and two together and realized that the body in Alabama was likely their missing person, Thomas Earl Beasley III. Who reported Beasley missing? His mother. That's understandable. Yeah. When Beasley's body was recovered, he was wearing a t-shirt that said Mississippi Long Bar. That was a bar in the Grand Casino. We have casino gambling on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. The authorities in Alabama knew that they needed to get it to the Mississippi law enforcement because he was possibly from Mississippi with that t-shirt. And that ultimately led in realizing that the missing person, the body was in fact Thomas Earl Beadley III. But there was no suspects at that point about any perpetrators. There was, an autopsy was performed and it was determined that he was beaten to death. And he suffered major lacerations and trauma to the skull. So they ruled it a homicide, but there was no suspects at that point. It was an open homicide investigation. Did their normal work as far as trying to determine what happened. They went to the Miss Abama. And the Miss Abama is a saloon. It's a bar. And they call it the Miss Abama because it's right on basically the Mississippi-Alabama line. It's a few miles west of the Alabama line. So it's the Miss Alabama. It's kind of a blue collar establishment where construction workers and truck drivers and plumbers, electricians, country people go to hang out and have a drink. That's where Beasley was at when he came up missing. His truck was found in the parking lot of the Miss Alabama. So that added another piece of intrigue to it. What happened to him? Why was his truck still there. So the investigation was unsolved. It was unsolved murder up until the point where Joe Nicholson, a task force officer who's with us today on our Safe Streets task force, got a call from a CI. A CI is a confidential informant. I'll let Joe pick it up kind of how he got introduced to that individual and about the conversation and how it got kind of kicked off. A Safe Streets Task Force generally is a drug task force that works drugs and violent crimes. We have sources and other things at our disposal to use. And just so happened that this CI mine, I stopped one night for a little bit of marijuana on him, didn't charge him with it, basically told him that at some point you might need me. And then at some point came when he got a DUI one night in one of our local cities, Ocean Springs. It was right around the time where a friend of his had came and talked to him about this murder. And he reaches out to me in an effort to try to get some help on this DUI, which started this whole process of how we uh, worked this murder case and how we worked it, just like we'd work a drug case. And it kind of continued from there. So I met with him that night. He calls me. He tells me that he has a friend of his. His friend's name was David Cannon, and that David had confided in him that he had picked a young man up from the Miss Alabama lounge one night and why he was driving him home. An incident occurred and 
he ended up killing him, putting his body in a pond up by some family land in Monroeville, Alabama. That's how this whole case started. That's where we started to work it out. And that was the very beginning of it as we worked it through, just like we worked the drug case through this whole thing. A couple of fascinating things about what Joe just said. Informants is how you make cases. And with the safe streets, as Joe said, we worked so many drug cases and agents and task force officers that work drug cases, they have the best informants and they hear about crimes across the board. So Joe, being a great task force officer, was out working the streets, had stopped the guy, he had some marijuana. He could have charged him with it, but he basically destroyed the marijuana on the side of the road and said, you may need me one day. He was setting the hook. He did the guy a favor and he said, you may need me one day. And the guy did need him one day when he got a DUI. DUIs are not easy things to work on. So if he called and said, you know, I know about some minor misdemeanor, that's not something that we would look to maybe help him with. But if he knows about a murder, that's a significant cooperation. I'm not sure the public realizes how vital informants are to law enforcement and solving crimes, but they solve crimes every single day. And some officers are great at developing sources and some are not so good, but Joe was great at it. That's how this case kicked off. When we got the information, it was like, what do we do? Most homicides and violent crime, people work it in a reactive manner. In other words, the crime has happened, so they have to prove who did it or who didn't do it. We were used to working drug cases, and we always try to catch people in the act, get them on tape. The murder's already been committed, so immediately our thoughts are, if this guy David Cannon says he killed him, Let's get him talking about it. Let's see what he says. Let's make a consensually recorded conversation and see if he'll admit to it on tape. What's the time difference from when Beasley went missing and his body was recovered? And Joe, you're learning this information about who did it or who's saying that they know who did it. I think it was about 10 months. The murder happened in April, I believe it was December. It, it was April yep. of that year, yep. and December's when I actually talked to the CI, and then we really started working quickly after that. So we had a story. The CI gives a story of what he's been told, and there's a lot of key things that happened during that process about the vehicle and the guy waking up and glass being busted out of a truck bed and the Miss Alabama being picked up. So he knew all this key information. So it gave us a lot of things to start to work and start to try to prove. And it started with, all right, let's get David Cannon in here again and get our CI to talk to him and see if he could get him on tape, like we said, to, to talk about it some more. But we also set a lot of other things in motion. We started letting Cannon know that we knew that he was in that bar. We knew where he worked at. We was asking all kinds of questions, which would prompt him to start trying to cover his tracks or maybe talk more, which is what we wanted him to do. When you approached Cannon with some of these questions, what did you say to him about why you're looking at him? Were you talking to a lot of people who were in that bar that day, or was there something that you told them that indicated that you were on to him? We didn't approach him directly. Went to the Miss Alabama and started interviewing people there at the bar and also went to Cannon's place of employment. He was a truck driver. The idea was to kind of turn up the heat without directly confronting him, to kind of get him nervous, get him worried, get him trying to cover his tracks and maybe make a mistake. So it was in light of that, kind of turning up the heat a little bit with the location of the crime and his employment that we had the CI reach out to Cannon and say, hey, I need to talk to you. There's a lot of rumors, a lot of things happening about this missing guy. Swing by and let's have a cup of coffee. That's what we did before we approached him directly. We wanted to set up a conversation between him and the CI. In other words, what we're trying to do is we want to get him to our CI's location and get him on audio confessing at some point, at least if not, giving us all the information. So at the point when it comes time to interview him, we already have the answers to the questions. It makes the interview so much easier because we already know what he said. He doesn't know that, but we know it. So we have all the answers to the questions that we're going to ask. And we know the ones that he's lied about and not lied about. So there's a lot of work in between that that needed to take place. We wired up the CI's house. 
we put a audio video device recording the living room area. We also put a recorder on the CI's person so that when this meeting took place, we would be able to monitor it. We had a transmitter as well. We could monitor it real time and then we would also record it via audio video. One thing that we were concerned about is that it was a consensual monitoring situation. Consensual monitoring means that we have one party's consent to record the conversation. If that party is not present, if that party goes to the restroom, if he goes outside to get something out of the mailbox, we no longer have legal authority to record the conversation or record anything that Cannon says. And in this case, Cannon showed up, but he showed up with a girlfriend. So immediately we had contingency plans and we told the CI, don't leave Cannon's presence. But if he would have, if he had to go to the restroom or he got a phone call and he had to go in another room, we were prepared to shut off the recorder. Because if the CI left the room and Cannon mentioned something to his girlfriend, we don't have legal authority to record that. That would take a Title III authorization signed off by a federal judge for us to be able to record that. As long as we have a consensual party present, we can record it all day long. Mississippi is a single party consent state, which was important. My other question is, you're listening via a transmitter. Where are you located? Good question. We were at the CI's house. His house was just a small ranch style brick house. It had a detached garage with a little breezeway between the house and the garage. Myself and another task force agent was actually inside that detached garage. Later, we realized that we forgot it's pretty much deer season in South Mississippi. So everybody's deer hunting. And at some point during that conversation, David Cannon wanted to come out of that garage to see a deer that the CI had recently killed. So we'd got a little nervous about where we were going to go, what was going to happen if they walked into that garage. But the CI actually did a pretty good job of keeping him away from that and not forcing us to have to get into a freezer or something. It actually was a pretty fascinating moment because Joe, he's a very humble man, but he and another task force officer, Keith Haver, were in the garage while this meeting was taking place. They needed to be in the garage because at that point, I won't go into details about our technical equipment, but they needed to be pretty close to the technical equipment. And so that's why they were in the garage. Myself and other task force officers were parked down the street so we could monitor real time as well. But Joe and Keith were in the garage while this was taking place. So when Cannon gets there with his girlfriend, number one, we were surprised that he didn't show up by himself. He had his girlfriend with him. We were a little bit concerned that maybe he wouldn't talk so much with her present, but that ended up not being a problem. He arrives at the house, they start drinking a cup of coffee, they sit in the living room, and the conversation starts off about deer season. And then the CI mentions he had shot a buck, and Cannon says, I'd like to take a look at that. At that time, Joe and Keith are in the garage, and they're looking at each other, and right by where they're hiding is a freezer. Well, in that freezer is the buck that the CI shot. So immediately, they start having to come up with a plan if they walk in the garage and what they decided to do was there was another freezer that wasn't plugged in. These are deep freezers, large freezers. They were going to hide in that freezer if they tried to come in the garage, which would be a pretty scary thought. But the case could have ended right there because if they would have walked in and Joe and Teep would have been discovered, Cannon wouldn't have said anything, obviously. It was a very tense moment and it all ended up working out all right because the CI was able to deflect that and get him talking about another subject, but it was very tense and there for a moment. Once they started talking, they broke the ice talking about deer season. Cannon brought up that the FBI has been to the Miss Alabama and they've been to my work. Immediately when he started talking about that, we knew that we were going to likely get some conversation about the murder. Cannon went on to say that he was thinking about going to Mexico. That was a critical piece of information that we learned that an innocent person does not flee the country, try to get away or hide from justice. And the most critical part of the entire conversation was Cannon was lamenting that the FBI is asking questions. This is all coming to a head. He may have to leave the country. And then he just blatantly says, 
I wish I tied another brick on his ass. And as soon as he said that, we all looked at each other and thought to ourselves, that is a pretty significant statement there that's going to be a major piece of evidence in a potential trial down the road. The smoking gun. Exactly. Because no one at this point knew that when they discovered the body in Alabama, it had some wire and cinder blocks tied to the body to weigh it down in the water. That hadn't been released to the media. That hadn't been released to anybody. As soon as he said that, we do right then that what we were being told by the CIA was accurate. And then he continued on further than that, more than just the uh, block. He, at that point then, pretty much went step by step through the whole thing. He outlined how after this happened, he had cleaned out his truck and that he had put new tires on. He was obviously trying to dispose of any forensic evidence in his truck. And he was worried about potential tire tracks that might have recovered from the scene. So that's why he changed out his tires on his truck. And ultimately, Cannon told the CIA, if this thing blows over, I'm going to marry my girlfriend. We're going to church and we're going to start living right. Now, I've since many times I've laughed with Joe about this statement because we had a judge here that used to say that he's converted more people to Christianity than any preacher in the state of Mississippi. And he would say that jokingly because when it comes time for sentencing, as you know, Jerry, family members, everybody will write the judge and say why the judge should be lenient for the defendant. We knew as it was going on that this was something very, very significant and we were obtaining a critical piece of evidence, just like we would do in the drug case, get the bad guy talking about it. But there was some risk. There was significant risk that we discussed prior to undertaking this. The risk is that Cannon would smell a trap, what he would consider to be a trap, Certainly wasn't entrapment. It was just a conversation between the CI and his friend. But if Cannon knew that the FBI had been asking questions, if he suspected the CI was cooperating, he could make some exculpatory statements, basically saying, I don't know anything about this. I was working that day. A bunch of different things he could say. I would never kill anybody. I'm not a violent person. And all of that would have been recorded and all of that could be played potentially at a trial. There was some risk to it, but we thought that certainly the reward was greater than the risk. And even if he would have made the sculptory statements, that we would be able to overcome them eventually with the evidence because we had a body, we had the CI statement to us. We thought that forensically we may be able to do some searches and things that would link him to the murder. And also prior to this, we already knew some of the answers as far as we already had his truck. We knew where his truck was at. We'd already went and saw his truck. He didn't know that because there's part of the story where the back window of his truck gets busted out and we find his truck. It was a sliding type window and part of that window had been replaced with a piece of plexiglass. So we knew that the story we were getting was accurate because some of the things he couldn't change because he had no idea we'd found his truck and we'd saw that it was busted out. He'd actually didn't fix it. So there were some things there that would help us recover from it if that did happen. Did you want to tell us a little bit more about those details? I take it these are details that Cannon has told the CI. What did he tell him happened that day? Because when you first mentioned that he picked up Beasley, then I assume he picked him up because they were going to have a quote unquote date. But then you talk about his girlfriend. Could you share some more about what Cannon told the CI happened? And these are the things I assume that you're trying to verify and gather evidence about. Right. So initially, the source had told me that David Cannon was at the Miss Alabama with Mr. Beasley and Beasley needed a ride home and asked Cannon to give him a ride home. And Cannon gives him a ride home. When they arrive at Beasley's house, according to Cannon, Beasley made a sexual advance towards him. He says that he lost it, got mad, punched him, threw him out of his truck. At some point, actually run him over with his truck. He thinks he's killed him. He throws him in the back of the truck and drives off with him, which is another point that's very important. So he thinks he's killed him, but he hasn't. Because at some point as they're driving, Mr. Beasley wakes up in the back of the truck and kicks the back window of his truck out. And Cannon has to stop again using a 
whiskey bottle and a shovel. It ends up beating Beasley again. This time he knows he's killed him. And then he drives him off and puts him in this pond in Monroeville, Alabama. So that's what the source tells us. That's what he tells us is he's been told. Well, when we have the recorded meeting, Cannon says that exact same thing, basically. What he's already told the source. Now we have it on video where Cannon has basically confessed to this murder in each one of the steps. Our responsibility now, knowing this and having it on this video, is to now go back and follow up with each one of these steps and see if we can prove it to make sure that at some point, Cannon can't recant and say, oh, I, I really didn't mean that or this didn't really happen. That's when the investigation really started was at that point. So we have all those facts on audio. We have the facts that the source has already told us. We have Cannon saying himself, and now we start the actual investigation and the arrest process. And I think on TV a lot, when you're watching a TV show or a movie, once you get the confession, it's all over and the investigation's done. Could either of you talk a little bit about why it's necessary now to get evidence to prove that this confession is valid? I'll speak a little bit on it and Jerome will finish up, but I will tell you one thing. The most important thing is that whenever you're working murder cases, and in really any case, the, the important thing is, is that if you're going to have a trial, you need to have a trial with physical evidence that doesn't require a statement from the defendant because you never know during the process of what happens if the statement of the defendant is the only thing you have, a lot of things can go wrong with that statement. There's a lot of things that can be not admissible in court at times. What you do not want to do is just rely on a statement alone. That way, if the statement is not admissible, you still have all the evidence that allows you to proceed with the case. Two other things regarding that. Number one is we had a recorded quote unquote statement from him, but it was a consensually recorded conversation. So when at some point Cannon gets a defense attorney, the defense attorney is going to try to craft a defense with his client. That's what they get paid to do. And they could later claim that, yeah, well, this was two buddies. He was bragging. A lot of people brag about stuff that didn't actually happen that way. That's one thing he could say was just talking out of the sky, so to speak. The other thing is, is that though it's rare, there have been cases where you get a false confession, where somebody admits to something that they didn't do. But in those cases, it's usually not an extensive, thorough interview where you get into the minutia, because if you get into the minutia, it's not going to make sense. You're going to be able to pick holes if they falsely confess to something. But if you have a short interview, it's more likely that could happen for whatever reason. It could be your subject has some mental problem or some issue or trying to hide some other thing that they don't want people to know about. It just depends. It is rare, but it does happen from time to time. So basically, we had him recorded by a CI, but we wanted to take a run at him to try to get him to confess in an interview with us. That was the next step. So once we had the initial recorded conversation, we went and met with the district attorney at that time. It was Keith Miller, and he authorized us to file a charge of murder against David Cannon based on the information we had up to that point. We got a warrant for him. And we set up a surveillance in Van Cleve, Mississippi, which is where David Cannon resided. Our task force went out there. We surrounded his house, discreet surveillance. We were looking for his truck to see if he was home and he wasn't home. So we basically just did a surveillance in the area and Joe ended up seeing him driving north on Highway 57 through town. He put it out on the radio. I've got him. I see him. The Safe Streets Task Force converged at a video store that he pulled into. Joe put out on the radio that he had somebody with him in the vehicle. We surrounded the vehicle and placed David Cannon under arrest, pulled the passenger out of the car, and it turned out to be a woman who was with him when the conversation with the CI took place. It was the same woman. She confided to us at the scene that she cannot believe this is happening because they just got married that day. They were married in Pensacola. Wow. That Friday, which was January 11th, 2002, they had driven back to Mississippi that evening. were just coming into town when Joe observed them on the surveillance. We pulled into the store where they had stopped, 
placed him under arrest, and it was the day of his marriage. So that's a fascinating thing about this case because I don't know many agents or police officers or task force officers that have actually arrested somebody on this person's wedding day. Wow. <laughs> Just the irony of all of that, you know? Plus the fact that this woman has married a man that she knows has murdered somebody. Exactly. There was a lot of conversation between us and the prosecutors about why did he marry? Did he marry her because he was trying to create some type of marital exclusion where she could not divulge information that he told her about the murder? We didn't know. That was later discounted because two things, when they had the conversation with the CI, they weren't married at that time. And the other thing is the marital exclusion only applies if it's just the husband and wife talking together. It does not apply if there's a third party in the conversation. And during the recording, the CI was there. Interesting. Very interesting. So we transported Cannon and his wife to the FBI office in Pascagoula. Joe and I interviewed David Cannon first in our interview room. Joe mentioned earlier about why you don't want to just rely on a confession was well, several legal issues came up during our interview. And the first one was, is that Cannon said, I should talk to an attorney. And Joe responded with, he's basically asking me, which I can't give him advice on the attorney. And he's saying, I should, he's not telling me he wants one or anything. So I tell him, just give me one second. I'm going to read you your rights and you'll understand where we're at with this. I go through and read his rights completely. He voluntarily waives his rights. He signs the waiver form and we start the interview process. And then we asked a couple of questions about if he knows why he's here, if he knows what's going on. He's starting to formulate his story in his mind and Drome kind of starts in with some other things and starts asking some other questions and I get back in it and Drome will kind of- And we'll go into detail on those legal questions that came up later because there was later a suppression hearing in federal court trying to get the statement thrown out. And I can see yeah. where the confusion is. Is he asking a question? Yeah. Or is he making a statement? To me, it yeah. sounds like a question. I should talk to an attorney. He was going through in his mind what he should do. We couldn't tell him what to do. Joe did the right thing and said, I'm fixing to read you your rights, listen to your rights, and you can make a decision. So he was nervous. He was like, you know, this is a big deal. I've just been arrested for murder. I should have talked to an attorney, but should and want are two different words. And we'll get into those in the suppression here later. We started out the interview. He waived his rights. He signed a waiver of rights form. He agreed to talk to us. And his initial statement was that he denied knowing Beasley and claimed that he was in Pennsylvania at the time of the murder. Cannon was a truck driver, so he would have a reason to be traveling interstate. He wanted to smoke a cigarette. We gave him a cigarette. He mentioned, I'm a completely different person when I drink. I immediately clarified that with, when's the last time you've had a drink? And he said, two days ago. That could have been important if he was intoxicated or something like that. Later, a defense attorney could argue that he didn't have the mental capacity to waive his rights. So I'm a completely different person when I drink. I thought it was a very critical moment because he's acknowledging not an excuse, but maybe a projection of blame or maybe a rationalization. Ultimately, he admitted to going to the Miss Alabama saloon that night with a friend. He admitted to seeing Beasley there, but he said he left early that evening because his friend needed a ride home. That turned out to be partially true. He also admitted to having been to the local library and looking up or reading articles about Beasley's missing person case, the murder. At this point, Joe asked him, how did the back window of your pickup truck get broken. David Cannon had a 1996 Nissan pickup truck, black in color. And Joe knew the answer to that question, but he was just kind of turning up the heat a little bit because up to this point, Cannon first denied even being in the state at the time of the disappearance and then put himself at the Miss Alabama lounge but then was crafting an alibi that he left early. So Joe's just turning up the heat a little bit, letting him know that we know more than we're disclosing. Cannon at that point crafted the story that he had been turkey hunting in April of 2001 in Alabama. And while he was hunting, someone had broken into his truck and broken the glass. 
which was important when he said it, because what he said was he was turkey hunting in April of 2001, which is when Beasley actually came up missing. His story, he couldn't think through it fast enough. That was the only date. He knew why the window was busted, and he almost spit it out right there. He was turkey hunting in a location where Beasley's body was recovered in Alabama. That's where the, this truck was broken into, allegedly. He was basically boxing himself into a story that he would not be able to substantiate. He denied. We asked if Beasley had ever been in this truck, and he said no. At this point, it was getting a little bit more tense in the interview. He was getting worried. He asked for another cigarette. We let him smoke another cigarette. He asked for some water. We gave him some water. And then after he finished taking his break, Joe opened up a folder on the desk. And in that folder, he had pictures of Beasley from the crime scene where his body was recovered. And Cannon took one look at that and immediately looked away. Wow. Joe, tell me a little bit about your reasoning of doing that. Really, the pictures themselves for actually for a death scene pictures were not extremely, I guess, gruesome. The body was recovered relatively within a few days of it. So it wasn't something that I was worried about later that we showed him such gory pictures that he started making these confessions because of the pictures. But what the pictures would do, it would just make an emotional response from him. People have two responses, emotional and mental. Mentally, People will tell you, as many people as we've interviewed who've confessed to different murders, a lot of them have the same problem is that mentally, they just can't handle it after a long period of time. Their mind's worried about it. They're just always worried about being arrested, and it takes a mental toll on them. So when you see that picture for the first time, I wanted to just elicit the response from him and see where he was going to go, because we were at that point to where he was very close to explaining all this to us. So I thought it was time that we basically just elicit an emotional response from him. And it turned out exactly what we thought was going to happen. Because Cannon's immediate response upon seeing the photographs was, I will tell you what happened. And then he followed that up with, do I need an attorney? When he said that, I grabbed the same rights form that I'd already read to him twice. So this was the third time. I turned it back over a third time and read it to him again. When I read it to him a third time, then at that point, he started going on to the story. So we never answered his questions because his questions about the attorney were questions to us, asking us for our advice. And the only thing we ever said to him was we just read the rights again and let him make the decision for himself. So he responded after Joe read him his rights again. He said, I'll tell you, I need some peace. That was a common technique that we used in our interviews lots of times, particularly with major violent crimes, murders, kidnappings, rapes, is that it's very difficult to get somebody to confess to something as horrendous as that and something that they're going to do significant time for. It's not like they're going to walk out of there if they admit to a murder. One of the things that we use is finding some peace. If you can't admit to the truth, if you can't say what happened, you can never have any peace. That's a common theme. When they're grasping for something, a reason to tell the truth, finding peace is a pretty big, significant thing. And he obviously bought into it and agreed to tell us what happened at that point. Let me just say that that's interesting. I think most people listening are thinking how interesting that is, because when we think of people that are involved in violent crime, especially murders, you think of them as sociopaths, people that have no feelings, have no emotions, but you're relying on the fact that this person is emotional, that this is weighing on them. Exactly. You always want to give somebody some hope. And there are sociopaths out there, but David Cannon was not one of them. There are people that do a horrible crime and they have some other redeeming qualities about themselves. And that's the trick of winning an interview is you talk to people like they're a person and you give them some hope for the future because, you know, we want to categorize everybody as evil or good. And the truth is a lot of people are a combination of the two. Now, not that a lot of people are murderers, but even a murderer can have some good attributes, something good that they've done in their life. And so you concentrate on that and you say, look, you know, you made a mistake here. You try to minimize it as far as making it easier for them to come to grips with, you say, you made a mistake. Was it a mistake? You dang right, it's a mistake. It's a lot worse than that. But you put it in context where it's easier for them to say, 
you had one bad day. You had one bad day in your life, okay? It's never too late to do the right thing. What are you going to do? You deserve peace. Thomas Beasley's family deserves peace. Tell the truth. That's the first step towards healing and making your life better and bringing closure to the family. So that's exactly how you do it. Plus, you have to remember, we already had the answers to the test, which, like I said, helps us because he'd already made a statement that if this all turned out in one way, he wanted to go to church and be better and wanted his life to change. We knew by kind of showing him the picture and that he already said what he wanted to happen. So we were just trying to get him to follow up what he said was going to happen. He went right into it and said that about 1 a.m. that night that he was at the Miss Alabama. Well, first he said that, yeah, I did leave early that evening and take another friend home, but I returned to the Miss Alabama. Okay. So a lot of times, you know, that initial statement, they give some partial truths. Yeah, he did leave early. He just left out a pretty pertinent fact that he came back to the Miss Alabama later that night. So he says, yes, I went back to the Miss Alabama. I saw Beasley there. And about 1 a.m. that morning, he asked me for a ride home. So I gave him a ride home. Did they know each other? This sounds kind of like he's... They knew of each other at a minimum. Cannon had rented a boat slip, I believe, from Thomas Beasley's father. Yep. So they at least knew of each other. I think they'd probably seen each other at the Miss Alabama possibly before. I don't, you know, I'm not 100% sure about that. But the bottom line is they knew who each other was. They obviously started a conversation. Was he asking for a ride home because he was intoxicated, too drunk to drive? Or did Cannon know that Beasley's truck or car was actually there? This whole I need a ride home thing, is this again a rationalization for Cannon? Because he doesn't want to admit that he was interested in a sexual relationship with Beasley? I don't think Cannon realized it at the time that that possibly that was what Beasley was interested in. I think it was just e- either Beasley had too much to drink or they would hang out together and drink together some that night. But it is true that later Cannon really became upset when he heard that Beasley's truck was found at the Miss Alabama because he said, he tricked me. I didn't know that his truck was there. And that really enraged him. So I think Cannon believed that he needed a ride home and that they would just drink some more on the way home. And maybe when they got to his trailer, drink a little bit more. That's what they did. He gave him a ride home. Cannon had a bottle of Jack Daniels in the truck that they drank from. And then they also stopped along the way and bought a six pack of beer. Cannon was a very, very heavy drinker, obviously. When they eventually arrived, at Beasley's house, which was on Lily Archer Road in Jackson County, out in the county. It was a trailer. Cannon pulled into the front yard, and it was actually right before they arrived there. Beasley said, I think you're good looking. And Cannon said, he replied with, I ain't interested in you. I like women. When they arrived at the trailer, Cannon said that Beasley told him, Please, please come inside with me. At that point, allegedly Beasley put his left hand on Cannon's shoulder and with his right hand, he grabbed Cannon's genitals. At this point, Cannon became enraged. He yelled a derogatory term towards Beasley that refers to homosexual males. I won't say it. It begins with an F. And Cannon hit Beasley as hard as he could. Beasley got out of the truck. He was upset with the rejection and just spontaneously kicked Cannon's truck. Cannon started to drive off and then something hit him where he just immediately got angry that Beasley had kicked his truck, according to Cannon. And so he made a U-turn in the front yard. And then the famous, the next thing I know statement where basically the next thing I know, Beasley is in front of my truck running directly towards my truck. And I hit him with the hood of my truck. He hit the front bumper and uh, came up on the hood and fell down. At that point, Cannon jumped out 
And in his words, he started kicking the shit out of Beasley. At that point, Joe looked down underneath the interview table in the interview room and said, was you wearing cowboy boots? And Cannon said, yes. Are those the boots you have on right now that you kick Beasley with? And Cannon said, yes, they are. At that point, Beasley was beaten unconscious. Cannon put him in the bed of his pickup truck and drove off. Cannon apparently didn't know what he was going to do, didn't really have a plan. This just started and he was trying to figure out what to do. And he said, while he was driving, I thought about taking him to the hospital, but then he kicked the effing windshield out. And that was referring to an incident that Cannon had already relayed to the CI that basically Beasley kicked the back windshield out of Cannon's truck. And when that happened, Cannon pulled over at the Tiger Mart grocery store on Forts Lake Road in Moss Point. He got out of his truck, he walked around to the bed, and he broke a Jack Daniels bottle over the head of Beasley. He then went back to his truck and retrieved a broken handled shovel and proceeded to beat Beasley to death. I take it this is the middle of the night and the grocery store is closed. This would be like 3 a.m. Yeah, it's probably 3 or 4 in the morning. And so the story really starts to add up with the broken glass now that we've already seen and the blood that we'll get into later on the boots. And it really gets important now because now we know by some of the evidence, plus by his own admission, that when that transportation begun, Beasley was actually alive. That will later become a big part in the federal prosecution that he had to be alive when the transportation began in order to be a federal kidnapper. So yeah, the grocery store was in a rural area and it's not like a big grocery store. This is like a stop and rob, like a little convenience store. So it was closed. There was nobody there at 3 a.m. in the morning. Another thing we discuss when we're doing these interviews too, that I think some people don't really understand how involved the interview gets is that we're already looking at charges and things that they could be charged with why we're interviewing them and looking at what some of the guidelines are that you need to be able to prove what's the burden of proof for these charges as you're interviewing people you can start to fill in those holes of burden of proof on the case itself which makes it a big difference when it comes time to prosecute if you already know what the guidelines are to have something kind of like this being alive with the transportation be gone and these other things Tell us about your experience. Had either of you investigated and tried to elicit a confession from a murderer before? Yes. Yes. Many, many, many times. Yes. And I tell you, it's not just murder cases too. So drug cases work the same. When you're interviewing somebody, you interview them with a different set of questions, but you're still trying to get that same outcome, which is cover your statutes, make sure that the stuff that they say can later be prosecuted. So all those things just kind of play into different types of interviews. It just doesn't have to be specific to murder cases to how someone's interviewed. So just by way of background, we're a Safe Streets Task Force, gangs, drugs, violent crime. We're in a small Mississippi town. The Pascal and Moss Point combined is about 50,000 people. It was routine in those days for us to respond to homicides and help the police department and help the sheriff's department with homicides. Now, I know Bureau has its policies, but my attitude was, is that we're going to help solve violent crimes. It'll either be prosecuted through the state or through the federal government. I don't care. But if you're not safe in your community, that's the most important thing to everybody. Like I say, all politics is local. Well, you guess what? Law enforcement is local too. And if somebody's not safe to walk to their mailbox, they're not really that concerned about what's going on between the Sunnis and the Shiites. Safety is the number one priority for everybody. They have to be safe in their home. That's how we ran the Safe Streets Task Force back then is that the reason the sheriff's department and the police departments had somebody assigned to our task force is because we work. Joe was on the task force for 14 years. We worked dozens and dozens of homicides. It was not an unusual thing for us to get involved in them. And we made a lot, a lot of good cases and hopefully we made the community safer over the years. This was something that we were used to doing and something we continued to do for many years. How many FBI agents were in the resident agency? And how do you pronounce it? Pasca? Pascagoula. Pascagoula. P-A-S-C-A-G-O-U-L-A. The Pascagoula Indians was a Native American Indian tribe from this area. 
So it's named after the tribe and there's the Pascagoula River runs right through the town. When I started back in 1991, there was two FBI agents here. Around 1994, I started the task force and we added, it eventually became where it was six task force officers and myself on the task force. Occasionally they would give me another agent to work on the task force, but oftentimes that agent would get pulled to work other matters and eventually they would, it wouldn't be full time on the task force. But most of the time it was myself and six task force officers from local agencies. We were a, a very significant presence in this town. We were the only federal agency other than customs, the port authority that had an office in town. So we were a one stop shop. We did it all. If somebody was going to send me a task force officer, they were going to get production. I mean, basically for a, a small police department or sheriff's department to, to lose a body to the FBI, that's a big deal. So I wanted them to get the bang for their buck. And we were very selective on who we picked, but we worked a lot of great cases. I'm very proud of that over the years because the FBI task force, if you said that name back in the day in this area, that meant a lot. I mean, they it get a bad guy talking really, really quick when we showed up because we had a proven track record. It was very exciting work. His reason, and I'll get into this later, but I mean, it's what everybody thinks about when they think of the FBI. They think of consensual recordings. They think of wiretaps. They think of undercover buys. They think of rips. They think of arrests. They think of crime scenes. And that was, that was happening all the time. It was such an exciting time period to work. Very proud of the different cases, what we accomplished. This is one case, but there are dozens similar to them. All right. So where were we now? We're in the confession. He is providing all the information. You can kind of just tick off the elements of the violation that you need. Yes. So at this point, he's confessed to the crime. And then he makes a statement. This has ruined the life of my daughters and parents. It's kind of a, a woe is me moment. Almost like you victimized other people as well. A lot of people has been affected by this, which was actually a good thing. He's acknowledging the hurt that he's caused, but then he skips and he, he kind of projects the blame on Beasley by said, I got really mad when they found his truck at the Miss Alabama. He didn't need a ride home, just wanted to have sex with me. He's trying to blame Beasley for causing his own murder, which is ridiculous. He admitted that they had both been drinking and were both drunk. So after he murdered Beasley at the Tiger Mart grocery store, he drove into Alabama and he went up to a hunting camp that had been in the family or his grandfather used or his father used. When he got there, it was a, re it was a very remote area, 130 miles away. He collected some chicken wire and cement blocks and he attached that, tied that to Beasley's body in the bed of the truck. And then he drove the truck down to the pond and threw Beasley's body into the pond. He disposed of the shovel and he burned Beasley's wallet. He spent the night at that trailer. The next day he got up, he went to a car wash. He disposed of the whiskey bottle. He swept out the broken glass from the bed of his truck. He washed his truck, tried to clean out any evidence of blood or the murder. And at the end of the interview, he just kind of spontaneously said, looked down and said, I never had a man do me like that, but I guess where I'm going, I'll have to get used to it. Wow. So it was a two hour interview. At the end, I followed up with why did Beasley kick out the window of the truck? And Cannon said, I don't know. I guess he was scared. So Beasley had been knocked out. From the initial assault at his residence, somewhere along the way, right before they got to the Tiger Mart grocery store, Beasley came to and was laying in the bed of the truck, rolling down the highway. Maybe he was trying to get him to stop. Maybe he was kind of delirious from the assault or from drinking. We don't know. But with his boot, he kicked out the back window of Cannon's truck. And then that's when Cannon pulled over and got out with the whiskey bottle and hit him over the head with it and then finished him off with the shovel. At that point, for the final time, we were concluding the interview and Beasley said, I can't have an attorney. 
three times during the interview, he brought up an issue of an attorney, but each time it was questioning us. So we responded each time the same way. And after we interviewed Cannon, we interviewed his wife and then we transported Cannon to jail. And then we knew that we had a lot of forensic work to do. So we obtained a search warrant for Cannon's truck. And we had our evidence response team come down from Jackson and we started to search the truck. And then what turned out important to this truck search is that since we already knew the answers. So what we're looking for now is is that he says that he had kicked Beasley multiple times with those boots over and over. So obviously there's going to be some blood on his feet, maybe in the boots. So we collected the boots. One of the things we wanted to do when we done the search warrant of his truck was trying to recover any forensic evidence. So one of the things that we recovered was the rubber pad that was on the brake pedal. We removed that, preserved it for evidence. The other thing was that early on, we knew that he had kicked that back window out behind that seat was still some pieces of broken glass. We was able to collect that further the story that yes, he did kick the window out. We did recover glass and then. We knew he had been in the back of that truck for some period of time, bleed. So at some point there obviously had to be a lot of blood in the back of that truck. And he tells us that he went to the car wash and washed it out. So whatever evidence was in the truck would have been washed out towards the tailgate. One of the things that we did that turned out to be really interesting was that I had the local fire department come to where we had the truck at doing the search. The tailgate on those only trucks are basically they're hollow. It's just metal that's bent over and so it's hollow on the inside. So I had them use their cutting tools for the fire department to cut that tailgate open and lay it open. And when we get the tailgate laid open in the corner of the tailgate was a kind of large spider web. The BRT team collected that for me because what we could immediately notice in that spider web was a hair. So they collected that stuff. And of course, all that was sent off to the crime lab. And later when that stuff came back, it turned out important. So Beasley's Blood was found to be on the brake pedal, which would story the the boots touching the brake pedal and that hair that was inside that spider web inside the tailgate, DNA come back to Beasley. That's fascinating. And what about Beasley's body? Did they find any evidence of the glass from the truck on his person? No glass from the truck. And I tell you a couple of things didn't, that never really came back. So this original story of running him over in his yard and hitting him and so the autopsy really didn't cover that either. The autopsy was more about the lacerations and the cuts to the facial area. And you could really tell that, but I don't think the impact from the trunk was something that was so great that it broke all the bones and things like that. I think what happened is what he said, it just knocked him out. At this point, we had a confession from Cannon. We had evidence from the search of his truck, which it took several months to get that back from the FBI crime lab. But. Actually having Beasley's hair in a spider web was very unusual as being to recover that eight months after the crime, having, you know, his blood on the brake pedal, having glass fragments that we recovered out of the cab of the truck. We believe we had a very strong case, both for a murder charge in state court, as well as a federal kidnapping charge, because based on the evidence and based on the statements, the assault kidnapping started at Beasley's residence. From there, they went to the Tiger Mart grocery store where Cannon actually killed Beasley. And then after that, he drove the body deep into Alabama to a remote area and disposed of Beasley's body. So when we researched the federal kidnapping statute, it said that a victim must be alive at the beginning of the kidnapping but the victim does not have to be alive when the victim is transported across state lines. This met the elements of the federal kidnapping statute. We could prove that he was alive when he put him in the bed of his pickup truck and drove off from Beasley's residence. Just a real quick thing on that too. A lot of people would say, well, why even worry about a kidnapping if you have a murder? Well, there's several issues in the murder. The state courts are backed up, extremely backed up, sometimes two and three years to get things into court and the federal system works much faster. So that's some of the things we were weighing back and forth of what to do and why to charge at certain ways. And at this point, this was 2001, there was no federal criminal statute for a hate crime involving 
a homosexual or transgender person or somebody because of their gender identity. That didn't happen until 2009 when the Matthew Shepard James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Act was passed by Congress and it amended the civil rights statute to cover gender, sexual orientation, gender identity or disability. It was really ahead of our time, but we felt, you know, if he killed him because he was gay, that's a pretty important element. In other words, the reason for the crime frequently matters. It's still murders a murders a murder. And all the old time homicide detectives will say, what difference does it make why he did it? He did it. What's well, true. You got to hold him responsible for it. But we always felt strongly that motives matter. So we wanted that to be an issue in state court. You don't have to prove why he did it. At this point, there was no hate crime statute that would cover it. Now, fast forward, you know, to 2015, our same Safe Streets Task Force did the first ever federal conviction for a hate crime murder of a transgender person right here in Pascagoula, Mississippi. This task force did it. So we were really ahead of our time back in 2001. And even when the statute was passed in 2009, there had been no successful conviction using that new hate crime statute until our task force worked to murder a transgender person. That's a different case, a, a topic and an interview for another day. Yes, definitely. That does sound like a significant case review that hopefully we can touch on in the future. Joe and I set up a meeting with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Biloxi, Mississippi at the time, and we pitched the case to him. We pitched the kidnapping that resulted in a murder because the federal kidnapping statute if a kidnapping results in a murder, there's obviously enhanced penalties. So we could charge it as a kidnapping that resulted in a murder. We pitched it to them and they told us no. Now, a lot of people are going to say, how can that happen? <laughs> but the U.S. Attorney's Office has the luxury of accepting or declining cases. And the District Attorney's Office do as well to some point, but it's just a completely different system. A police officer can arrest somebody and later the district attorney will dismiss. But generally speaking, the FBI doesn't arrest somebody without getting the thumbs up authorization from the U.S. attorney's office that they're going to charge. And if they're not going to prosecute the case, there's no need to arrest them. You're wasting your time. You're spinning your wheels. We pitched the case to them and they said, no, they said it's a local matter. Let it be tried in state court. And that was the go-to declination that we got many, many times over the years. And I'm not criticizing the U.S. Attorney's Office. They do their job. They prosecute. We investigate. That's their decision where to make because they prosecute a lot of good cases for us as well. But in this case, they declined it, which is important because once they decline it, that gives us the full opportunity to go somewhere else. So Pascagoula is right on the Alabama-Mississippi state line. We're in Mississippi, but we can get to Mobile, Alabama in 45 minutes. So once the U.S. Attorney's Office in Mississippi declined, picked up the phone, and I called the chief of the criminal division in Mobile and set up a meeting. Joe and I, through a U.S. attorney that we'd used on drug cases before, that got us into that. And that's another thing that comes back to working drug cases and doing those things and developing those relationships that we just knew there was a very aggressive U.S. attorney that was in Mobile that prosecuted drug cases with us before that actually got us the introduction. Joe and I drove over to the U.S. attorney's office in Mobile. And in the meeting was the chief of the criminal division, Gina Van, and the new U.S. attorney, David York. Joe did his pitch, told him all about the case. And they said it's a very interesting case, and we're going to take it under advisement. Joe and I left there. We were kind of on pins and needles, but we were happy that they didn't say no. They were going to take it under advisement. And I think surmising what that meant now, looking back, they probably wanted to call U.S. attorney to U.S. attorney and make sure they weren't going to piss anybody off if they took the case. That's what I was thinking. That's exactly yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah. A couple of days later, we get a phone call and Gina Van said, we'll take the case. And the U.S. attorney wants to co-prosecute it. And he and I, the chief of the criminal division, the mobile division, and the U.S. attorney are going to personally try this case in federal court. This was actually going to be the new U.S. attorney's first case that he would prosecute in federal court. It sent a really, really big message to us that 
we had a good case. We knew we did. It was a case that warranted being tried in federal court. And they were making a statement by putting two head people at the U.S. Attorney's Office were actually going to try it themselves. So we were just thrilled. But just to get an idea of how significant it was for them to take this case, you've got jurisdiction both in Mississippi and Alabama because he crossed state lines. But the murder actually happened. The kidnapping started in Mississippi. 99 out of 100 times, it's going to be prosecuted where the murder happened in the federal district where that happened. In this case, they were saying, well, he dumped the body here. That gives us jurisdiction. We're going to prosecute. That's unusual. They had every legal right to do it. In a way, because sometimes you have to remember, too, when you work in cases, they may have jurisdiction on it, but there's another issue of venue. Do they have the venue for it? And that becomes another problem. Even though it's a federal court, there's still the difference between having jurisdiction and having venue over something where, in this case, actually the U.S. Attorney's Office in Biloxi had the venue over it, but they declined. Could you explain the difference between jurisdiction and venue for everyone? The federal government's jurisdiction, obviously, is United States wide, except to prevent a, let's say, the U.S. District Court in New York showing up in Pascagoula, Mississippi and saying, I'm going to charge this federal crime that happened in Pascagoula because I'm a federal entity. It doesn't work that way. They don't have the venue. They have the jurisdiction, but they don't have the venue. The venue belongs to the U.S. Attorney's Office here, so it helps kind of separate all that. That's the best legal advice you'll get from me. <laughs> from a lot of non attorney. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I could see how people could be confused about the difference. So I just wanted to make sure that we took the time to break that down for them. Yeah. For the record, Joe Nicholson is the smartest man I've ever met with a Mississippi GED. That's what we call him down here. <laughs> Joe's incredibly, incredibly intelligent. And I'll just leave it at that. All right. Cannon was indicted by a federal grand jury in the Southern District of Alabama. I think he was appointed a counsel. And then the first thing that his counsel did was request a suppression hearing to try to get his statement thrown out. So a suppression hearing was held in federal court in Mobile. Both Joe and I testified during it about the interview, about the three times where the subject of attorney came up out of Cannon's mouth during the interview process. And the judge ruled that the confession was valid. In her ruling, she said, invocation of counsel must be unambiguous. A subject can contemplate without invoking. So that's what the judge ruled. And we were able to get his confession into the trial. The trial was in December of 2002. And the interview and confession was an integral part. The CI's recording of the conversation with Camden was an integral part. The FBI lab analyst testified about the DNA recovered, the hair from the spider web. All of that was the prosecution's witnesses. The U.S. attorney played the video from the recording between the CI and Cannon, and the video was stopped at the point where Cannon said, I should have tied another brick to his ass. The jury was able to really take that in about that admission when Cannon didn't know he was being recorded. That just shows about the character or evil thought process that he had. It wasn't about he was sorry for doing it. He was basically sorry he got caught and wish he wouldn't have gotten caught. If the body wouldn't have been recovered, he would have felt he would have walked free, so to speak. A guilty verdict was returned on December 17, 2002. Cannon was sentenced on March 25th, 2003. Cannon spoke at his sentencing and said, I'm sorry for what happened. If I could give him his life back, I would. But he planned what he did to me that night. If he hadn't have done it, he'd still be alive today. Still blaming the victim. Projection of blame, victim blame. I don't think that went over very well with the judge. The defense attorney for Cannon spoke at the sentencing, arguing for a lenient sentence, and he made a statement, something to the effect. His argument was, Your Honor, this case was basically a barroom fight. If my client would be charged in state court, he wouldn't get more than about five years for this. And that 
defense attorney obviously had represented a lot of people in state court. It just goes to show from my way of thinking, the importance of taking some cases in federal court, because people like to think that there's all these cases where people are just getting locked up and thrown away and the keys just disregarded and everybody's getting these tremendous sentences. But there's a whole lot of people that have committed murders and have been charged in state court that are walking around the streets today. There's lots of them. So you don't always get a life sentence for a murder. And you never know what you can get out of a jury. If the defense attorney would have played up the sexual past, the homosexuality and victim blamed, you never know what you could get from a jury in state court or in federal court for that matter, anywhere. Blaming the victim, so to speak. The judge sentenced David Cannon to life in a federal prison. After the sentencing, something very unusual happened in federal court, something you don't see very often, but there was a disturbance. The brother of Beasley, who was wearing a cowboy boots, a Western type outfit, he yelled out towards Cannon, you killed my brother. And then Cannon's dad responded with, you see what kind of people brought this on? And then there started to be conflict. Both families moved towards each other in the courtroom and Joe and I had to separate them. Beasley's mom yelled out, he killed a good boy. And then somebody from Cannon's family yelled, that's what he gets for trying to get with a man. The marshals were called. It was a disturbance in the courtroom. And you see this in state court from time to time, but I've never seen something like this happen in federal court before. It was very, very tense. It was a very volatile situation. And Beasley's family was very hurt by it. His mama actually said when she left, I hope one day your son has the conscience to tell the truth. She said that towards Cannon's family. Actually, I had chills just trying to understand the hatred and homophobia that would make a family or make people believe there's justification for killing somebody because they made an advance, a sexual advance. Yeah, I tell you, one of the things we do this whole case, the only I guess they, that we never were able to put any credit to is what Cannon said happened. Beasley's family was adamant that he was not gay. He had a girlfriend and that they have no reason why this ever come up or why he's saying this. Cannon never wavered from what he said happened. We'll never know on the other side because Beasley's not here to tell his story. There was two people there. Our position is we don't care. Beasley could have been gay. He could have been bisexual. He had a girlfriend. We don't know. But out of Cannon's own mouth, that was his justification. That's what he said happened. And, you know, it was a different time period. That was over 20 years ago. There were still a lot of people in the deep South back then that had very strong feelings about gender issues and homosexuality. So that was something for whatever reason, his family didn't want to believe had occurred. So we don't know, but out of Cannon's own mouth, that's what happened. And that was his justification. If a female would have made a sexual pass at him that night after drinking at the bar, she'd still be alive today. I wanted to sit with that for a little bit. Wow. So this is just one of, as you mentioned, many, many, many cases that you worked in the Safe Street Task Force. I forgot to ask you to explain to people who haven't listened to another episode where we talk about the members. You mentioned it a little bit, but who they are and the fact that by being on the task force, they are deputized. Explain that to everyone. Yes. So when we start a task force, the local officers that are on the task force, either the local state officers that get on a task force are deputized with federal arrest powers, federal investigative powers. So they have the exact same powers that any FBI agent has. And when you work in a task force environment, and this case is a perfect example of it, criminals don't look at jurisdictional lines. They don't look at state lines. They don't look at city lines, county lines. They commit their crimes as they're going to commit them. So sometimes we need to charge a case through the state. Sometimes we need to charge a case through the federal system, or sometimes it's both. 
And being in a task force gives us that ability to do that because like Joe, an officer of the sheriff's department, a deputy of the sheriff's department, he had full law enforcement powers in the state of Mississippi. But once he got on the task force, we deputized him federally. So when we went into Alabama, when we went out of state, he had complete authority to make arrests and conduct investigations there as well. And same thing, even though the Bureau doesn't like us doing it these days, but federal officers could get deputized by a local sheriff so that we would be protected. If we're out working a case and we see a state crime committed in our presence, we're covered from liability issues. If we get sued later or if we want to testify in state court, it gives us that extra level of protection. So it's really important. We are at the point of the interview where we get to learn a little bit more about you. So why don't you go first, Jerome, and tell us when and why you joined the FBI? I always wanted to be in law enforcement. It was a passion of mine. I applied with the FBI and I said, if God wants this to happen, it'll happen. And it did. I was just blessed to have the career that I did, but I loved the job. When I was growing up, I didn't see the police as the bad guy. I saw them as the good guys. In my entire career, with a few exceptions where our task force had to arrest some cops that committed crimes, the police were the good guys. So I wanted to be part of that. I wanted to be part of the solution. I wanted to do good. I wanted to help serve the public. So that's what got me interested in the FBI. And it was a very, very rewarding career. Joe, when and why did you join law enforcement and why did you want to be a part of a federal task force? Same with Jerome. I don't remember when it was, but probably most of my life, that's all I've ever wanted to do is be a police officer. I spent a few years in the military that I got out and immediately went to work for the sheriff's department. And then not long after going to work for the sheriff's department, I was on a local narcotics task force, our own task force. And shortly after that, the guy that run the task force back then was a former member of the Safe Streets Task Force. Within about a year or so of being on that task force, drove and approached me to get a Jackson County deputy on the FBI task force. And I accepted. And 14 years later, I was still there when I decided to take the job as the commander of the local task force back here, not long after, uh, long before Drove retired. That federal task force really changed the path of my career for the better for a long time. I'm still here. I'm the director of narcotics for Jackson County now. I have an office of about 16 people that cover the narcotics and the drug interdiction and our crime lab section, and I'm still at it for a little while. Jerome, you're now retired. What are you doing? I'm working on my memoirs. I've about got them written. I hope to have that published one day that covers my 30-year career and a lot of the cases that Joe and I worked and the other task force officers worked here in Pascagoula. I'm also doing some law enforcement training where I teach de-escalation techniques to police, as well as advanced investigative techniques, training seminars. Well, Jerome, my thing is to help FBI agents who have written books to get the word out through my FBI reading resource, which now has over 70 books on it. You have got to promise me as soon as your book is published that we're going to have you back on for you to do another case review on the podcast. Is that a promise? That's a promise. I'd love to. Okay. As a matter of fact, what's the record for the most podcasts that a retired agent has done with you? Four. Four. Well, possibility, I'm not promising it. If you will have me and Joe and some of the other task force officers, a possibility we could even break that one day. Oh, that sounds like you have lots of great stories to share. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yep. What I'd love to do is to give my guests the last word. So, Jerome, what would you like to say? I'd like to encourage anybody that's interested in a law enforcement career to consider the FBI. It's a fabulous place to work. You can really meet some great people and help a lot of people. And it was the privilege of my life to work in Pascagoula on the FBI Safe Streets Task Force with Joe Nicholson and the other task force officers. And Joe, what would you like to say? Anybody who is considering a career in law enforcement, don't let today's media and times discourage you from it. The career is still a very good career. We need to actually start changing things back to the way they were, where people want to be law enforcement officers. We need good young people back in the profession. If you get into the profession and you realize how rewarding it is, for the most part, you'll be able to have a good career. 
And that's the end of the interview. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there's a link to the show notes where you'll find a photo of Jerome Lorraine and Joe Nicholson, along with several news articles and images from this case. You'll also see a link to other FBI retired case file review episodes featuring kidnapping and murder investigations. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. You can show me just how much you liked it by buying me a coffee. There's a link in your podcast app's description of this episode, or you can visit jerrywilliams.com and tap on the little coffee cup icon in the bottom right-hand corner of my website. Don't forget to follow FBI Retired Case File Review on your favorite podcast app. Now, this podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, once a month via my reader team email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of more than 70 books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There's nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You'll also get my FBI reality checklist, where I debunk 20 cliches about the FBI and receive news about what I'm up to and about my FBI nonfiction and crime fiction books. I want to thank you for listening to the very end. I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.